A number of years ago, a psychologist named James Reason was trying to understand the kind of thinking that led to dangerous driving and car accidents. And so he asked lots of different drivers to estimate the number of times that they'd committed certain driving errors. Things like failing to check your rear view mirror or being in the wrong lane at a junction. And beside each mistake, they were being asked to estimate whether the, their driving was better or worse than the average. And the results were very interesting because out of a total number of 520 drivers surveyed, just five considered themselves worse than the average. The other 99% of them thought that they were at least average or even above average in their driving. And since then, many other studies have recorded this better than average effect. They show that in general, we tend to think of ourselves as more intelligent or more creative or more athletic or dependable or honest or friendly than most other people. In fact, the guy called Ethan Zell from the, the University of North Carolina, he says that the evidence is so strong that it's one of his favorite classroom exercises. He says, if you give, <coughs> excuse me, if you give people a questionnaire where they rate themselves relative to the average, almost everyone in the class thinks that they are above average at almost everything. Now, of course, none of us here this morning would like to think like that, would we? Surely we would never fall into the trap of pride or arrogance. When it, when it comes to accurately assessing our abilities, we are surely better than the average. Or maybe that just proves a point. The church. It's supposed to be a community of people where humility and love and unity is expressed. But really, we're not always like that, are we? Pride can so easily creep in and make us think things like, well, my church is better than your church. Or my understanding of the Bible is better than your understanding of the Bible. Or I would never make a mistake like that person just did. Now, maybe most of us wouldn't say those things out loud. But that kind of thinking, that kind of arrogant thinking shows itself when we compete with other people, when we criticize them for what they've done, or when we condemn them, or even when we cut ourselves off from them. Pride is at the root of so much of the division that happens in the church. This was a major problem in the church in Corinth. It had formed little cliques around their favourite celebrity leader. And they were competing and criticising each other, thinking, my group is better than your group. My leader is better than your leader. And so in chapter 4 of 1 Corinthians, Paul challenged this attitude. He demonstrated that instead of thinking of ourselves as better than others, we should see ourselves as servants and stewards of Christ. So we're going to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1 down to verse 7. This then is how you ought to regard us, as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the mysteries of God has revealed. Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. I care very little if I am judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait until the Lord comes, who will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of the heart. At that time, God will receive their praise from God. Now, brothers and sisters, I have applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit so that you may learn from us the meaning of the saying, do not go beyond what is written. Then it will not be puffed up in being 
then you will not be puffed up in being a follower of one of us against the other. For who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you did not receive? And if you did not receive it, why do you boast as though you did? Paul had the amazing privilege of being an apostle. He'd been personally chosen and commissioned by the risen Lord to preach the gospel where it had never been preached before, to introduce people to Christ and to lay the foundation of local church communities of God's people. And Paul was incredibly effective at doing that. But none of this had gone to Paul's head. He knew that there was no place for pride in God's kingdom. So he wrote this section of 1 Corinthians, so that you will not take pride in one man against another. That's what Paul says in verse 6. Competition, rivalry, jealousy, quarreling have no place in God's family. That applies to fighting over celebrity leaders or preachers, like what that church in Corinth was doing. But it also applies to fighting over prominence or position or, or in any situation in our lives. Being proud of our, our abilities or our achievements or our understanding or our Bible knowledge or our income or our family or experiences or spiritual maturity or, or anything else in our lives is just ridiculous and wrong. And Paul demonstrated that here by showing us how he and Apollos saw themselves and how this affected their attitudes and their actions. So first of all, in verse one, he said, men ought to regard us as servants of Christ. Now that word servant here in that verse is actually literally the word under roar. And it comes from the world of, of Roman galley ships. Because on those ships were slaves whose job was to row those boats as directed by their master. And the slaves that were on the lower levels, they were called the under rowers. And that's how Paul wanted people to see him. He wasn't the captain or even just one of the officers on the, on, in God's kingdom. He was simply a galley slave who was who was just doing, just following the orders of his master. He was a servant who was just seeking to live in obedience to Christ. And that is the humility that should characterize everyone who was trusted in Jesus. Listen to what Jesus taught in Matthew chapter 23, verse, verse 8. Jesus said this, but you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one master, and you're all brothers. And do not call anyone on earth father, for you have one father, and he is in heaven. Nor are you to be called teacher, for you have one teacher, the Christ. The greatest among you will be your servant. So folks, there should be no hierarchy in any church. No elevated positions, no pecking order, no titles, no reason for one person to, to take pride in themselves or in others against somebody else. Instead, we should all see ourselves as servants of Christ, committed to follow his orders. So our first question is to see, is to ask, is this how we see ourselves? Is this how we look at others in our, in our church or in other churches? Are we willing to humble ourselves and see ourselves simply as servants of Christ? Are we willing to refuse to compete with one another 
for position or power or prominence and instead be committed to just obeying whatever Jesus calls us to do. And that's important because this is what it is to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. Because as Jesus said, even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Paul didn't just see himself as a servant, but he also described himself here as a steward. He said they were, they were those who were entrusted with the secret things of God. That's verse 1 again. A steward, he managed everything for his master. He had great authority and responsibility, having to direct all of the, the affairs and the activities of his master and make decisions. But the, the crucial thing is that he didn't own anything of what was entrusted into his care. He was only the manager of his master's business and possessions. So Paul and the other apostles, they had been entrusted with something that belonged to God. And that was the secret things of God. And that goes back to chapter 2 in this letter. If you remember that Paul said, we speak of God's secret wisdom. This is God's plan of salvation that was fulfilled through the death and the resurrection of Christ. And Paul and the other apostles, they had been entrusted with this gospel. This truth had been hidden in the past, but had now been revealed to them. And they'd been given the responsibility to go, to, to go and to share this message with a lost and a dying world. And it was a great honour and a great privilege to declare God's offer of forgiveness to everyone who would put their trust in Jesus. But with that privilege and with that honour came great responsibility too. That meant they were accountable to God for how they handled this message. Verse 2 says that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. Yes, as an apostle, Paul did have authority and, and influence. But as a steward, he was answerable to God for how he used that responsibility. You know, that's similar to, to you and to I. We've been given amazing, the amazing privilege of hearing the gospel of Jesus for ourselves. And if we have been, if we've trusted in Jesus, if we've accepted this gospel, then we've been brought into God's kingdom. But as members of God's kingdom, we've been called by Jesus to go and make disciples of all nations. As Jesus said in Matthew chapter 28, as believers in Jesus, we have been entrusted with the gospel. The wonderful good news of Jesus has been entrusted into our care for this generation. And we've been commissioned to go and to be Christ's ambassadors, to be his courageous witnesses in this world. And so we now need to be faithful in holding on to the truth of the gospel, without twisting it, without distorting it, without adding to or taking away from it. And we need to be faithful in passing on this life-giving message to all the people around us, wherever and whenever we can. As Peter wrote, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. This is a great privilege and a great honour. And it's been given to us. But that doesn't give us any reason for pride or arrogance. 
because it's a gift to us of God's grace. The Apostle Paul had been amazingly effective in his ministry. Through his preaching, many people came to Christ, they were brought into the church, and they were established to and encouraged to live for Christ. And since then, many more people, millions of people, have been, their lives have been transformed through Paul's writings in his letters. But Paul didn't take any credit for this. He was not proud of those things as if they were his achievements. That's because he knew that he was not the owner of this gospel. This wasn't his message. This wasn't his plan of salvation. He didn't save anybody. Instead, this was God's message that had been entrusted into his care. So he knew that he'd been called to be a steward of the gospel by grace. In chapter 15 of his letter to the Corinthians, he says in verse 9, for I am the least of the apostles and do not deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Paul knew that his role, his ministry, was all a gift of God's grace. And he wanted the church in Corinth to have that same attitude. So have a look at verse 7 of our passage in chapter 4. He says, For who makes you different from anyone else? What do you have that you didn't receive? And if you did receive it, Why do you boast as if you did not? As Christians, we need to remember that everything that we are and everything that we have is a gift from God. Because God, in his grace, has given it to us. We are part of God's family today by his grace. It is by grace you have been saved through faith and this not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. As Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, we did not deserve any, any of this. We could never earn this. And we can certainly never pay it back. And said, our salvation is a gift of God's unconditional love and outrageous generosity paid for by the cross of Jesus. And if that wasn't enough, then by God's grace, God has come to live in us by his Holy Spirit to encourage and equip us and empower us to serve him faithfully in his kingdom. And so anything that we achieve or accomplish for him is only because of God's grace that has been given to us. So how could we ever be proud or arrogant or think that we are better than anybody? Everything that we have and everything that we are is a gift of God's grace. And it's been given to us because of Jesus' death on the cross. So instead of pride, as we fix our eyes on Jesus this morning, our hearts should be filled with humble gratitude and deep commitment for the one who loved us and gave himself for us. In the words of Isaac Watts, this beautiful hymn, when I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain I count but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. So as Christians, We are called to be humble like a servant and we're called to be faithful as a steward. And as we do this, 
We are called to wait till the Lord comes. That's verse 5. We need to wait for the Son. Because if we do not, then we'll make a wrong judgment about ourselves or about others. Some people we know are always worrying about what other people think of them. They are puffed up with pride when someone praises them. And they get really upset and discouraged if somebody thinks badly of them. And of course, social media just makes all of this worse. As we can track what people think of us in the, in the comment section eh, or by the number of, of likes or, or followers or friends that we have. But Paul, he was keen to avoid this trap of popular opinion. Look at what he said in verse 3 of our passage. He said, I care very little if I'm judged by you or by any human court. Now, Paul knew what it felt like to be judged. It happened lots of times. He knew how painful it was to be criticized or to be rejected by others, even other believers. And he had the scars on his body to show the consequences of being judged by the law courts. But Paul refused to be controlled by any of this. He didn't live his life based on what other people thought about him or even based on the decisions of a magistrate. But neither did Paul just do what he felt was right. He says in verse uh, 3 and 4, <coughs> excuse me, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. So many people these days, I don't know if you've heard people say that. I certainly have. I've heard people say, just follow your heart. If it feels right, or if you've got peace about it, or if it's what you sincerely believe, then that makes it okay. But Paul disagreed. Now, that didn't mean that he didn't listen to his conscience at all. In fact, he claimed that he, I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man. He said that in Acts chapter 24. So Paul did, uh, he did care for his conscience. He did try and follow it in a sense. But he knew that his conscience was not the ultimate standard by which he had to live. He knew the deceptiveness of the human heart. He knew that people could convince themselves of anything. But that doesn't make it right. So if we're following our conscience, that doesn't necessarily mean that we're doing what is right. So that's why Paul refused to judge himself. Instead, as a servant and a steward... Paul knew that ultimately he was answerable to God. This is what he says in verse 4. It is the Lord who judges me. Now, as we saw last, as, uh, last week, Paul was not thinking here about God judging whether somebody should be saved or not. He knew that through his faith in Jesus, all of, all of his sins were forgiven, and he'd already been declared right with God for all eternity. So this judgment that Paul was, was thinking about was not judgment about salvation, whether he goes to heaven or whether he goes to hell. Instead, Paul here is thinking about what we, what we call the judgment seat of Christ. When Jesus will review our service for him, and by his grace, he will reward us for whatever we have done for him. So he says in verse 5, at that time, each will receive his praise from God. And it's this that we're supposed to live for. Not the praise of others, or even the praise of ourselves, the pat on the back that we, we give ourselves. Instead, in humility, in humility, 
We are to focus on serving the Lord and doing what pleases him. And it's this focus that will, will protect us from taking pride in ourselves or even taking pride in others. And that's because waiting for the son's judgment will stop us from judging too soon. Therefore, Paul says in verse 5, judge nothing before the appointed time. When we take pride in ourselves or, in our, or, our, or others, then we make a premature judgment. Because we don't know the end of the story yet. We don't know how that person's life will, will end. I think that some of the recent scandals that have happened in the, in the Christian world have proved this. Men have been put up, up on pedestals as celebrity Christians, only for them to fall so tragically. So pride in ourselves or in other Christians, pride is too soon. Today is not the final test of our lives. What matters most is not how we start, but how we finish. So we're called to live for that final review of our lives, to run right to the finish line, because that's the judgment that matters. But waiting for the sun will also stop us from judging too superficially. Look at verse 5. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of men's hearts. As human beings, we are far too influenced by external appearances. We're far too easily impressed by an eloquent preacher or a charismatic worship leader or a powerful evangelist or even an attractive looking church. But when we do that, we're not seeing the full picture. We're only looking on the surface of things. But what matters to God is the heart. It's the private thoughts and motives of a person. It's what they're like when nobody is looking. It's their true character that matters to God. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. 1 Samuel 16 verse 7 says. So pride is not just too soon. Pride is also too superficial. How we appear in public is not what matters. We need to wait for the one who looks right into our hearts and sees what we are really like. So although pride is common in our world, Although we have a te that tendency, that inbuilt tendency to think of ourselves as better than others, we need to fight against that attitude because it's got no place in God's church. Instead, we need to take Paul's advice here. Verse 6, do not go beyond what it is written. We need to make it our goal to live in a way that will please the Lord by living according to his word. So this is how Paul wants us to live. He wants us to be humble as servants of Christ, seeking to obey our master in everything that we do. And he wants us to be faithful as stewards of the gospel of Christ, taking his good news faithfully to the world. And as we do this, let's not judge how we or others are doing. Instead, wait, let's wait for the Son of God to come. 
and to review, uh, review our lives and to reward us for what we've done for him and do that for his honour and for his glory. Let's pray. Father God, we just, we, we realise, Lord, that pride and arrogance, competition, competing with others, criticising others, condemning others, eh, pulling other people down, judging others, Lord, it's, it just comes so naturally to, to us. We know that's our, that's our natural tendency, Lord. We know that with that, we can see that in, in other people's lives, but we can see that in our own life too, Lord. But we know that that has no place in our lives. Those of us who have trusted in, in your son, the Lord Jesus, those of us who have been saved so uh, miraculously, so outrageously, so lovingly by, by, his, by his sacrifice on the cross. So Lord, I just pray that you'll help us. Help us to, to hear what you've said to us uh, this morning. Help us to humble ourselves as your servants, Lord. Help us not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought, but instead just see ourselves as people who are called to serve the Lord Jesus Christ in the way that he has directed us, in the way that he has called us, in the, in the roles and the situations that he has given to us. And Lord, as we do this, help us to realize that, that you have made us stewards of the secret things of God, this wonderful gospel that you have entrusted into our care. And Lord, I just pray you'd help us to, to guard that, to hold on to it without letting it be, be, be distorted or twisted or, or impacted by all of the, the false teaching that's out there in the world. Help us to hold on to it, but also help us to go and hold it out to this world to share it with those around us, Lord, to faithfully pass it on to everybody that we can, because we know that this, this, this privilege, this honour of being your, your, your kingdom, your church, Lord, has been given to us by your amazing grace in our lives. Lord, we don't want to take pride in anything that we are or anything that we have as if we did not receive it as a gift from you, Lord. Help us to remember that all we are has come to us through the cross of Jesus, through his sacrificial death for us, through his suffering and shame, through his body broken and his poured out blood. And Lord, may that humble our hearts, but, but also inspire us and empower us to, to, to dedicate our lives to serving you, faithfully serving you right up into the end of our lives, knowing that ultimately it's how we live for you that matters and how you see our lives that matter, Lord. So help us not to live uh, thinking about what other people think, thinking about what we ourselves think of ourselves. But Lord, help us instead to live to please the Lord, to live for that final review of our lives to live so that we might have something to honour you with, to praise you with, to glorify you with, to reveal what you have done by your grace in our lives. Lord, keep us humble and help us to serve you and help us to be a good steward of what you've put into our hands. And Lord, help us to do it for your glory and for your praise. In Jesus' name. Amen.